Amen. Take your Bibles if you would tonight. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and find one single verse, chapter, or uh, verse 14. Romans chapter 5 and uh, look at verse 14. I'm going to preach on types tonight. Talk about that just in a second. Romans chapter 5 and verse 14. chapter 5 verse 14 this is what it says it says nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression who is the figure of him that was to come that's all we're going to read tonight let's go ahead and pray we'll get in the message Father we're grateful pray Lord that you bless us and uh, give us a good time to word help us to be straight to the Lord and help us to learn, Lord, exactly what a type is and uh, how a type is to be used. And so again, we're thankful. Bless us now. We draw this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, if you're like me, someone announcing they're going to preach on types or preach on a type, it doesn't actually put me on the edge of my seat. It never did. Uh, matter of fact, you don't hear very uh, many times or very often when somebody preaches about types. And uh, my, my, my mind's light even tends to automatically dim down. And my mind's eye goes into a distant stare when I think about it. Then, something helped me uh, with this because I contemplated the purpose of types in the Bible. Meaning, what, what exactly is the purpose for a type? Or what exactly is a type? I think it'll help us if we learn that, and then I want to give us a little example tonight, it won't be very long, but I want to give, you a, give us an example of a type, and I hope by the time we get done, you'll see how useful it is. And, uh, and so what exactly is the purpose? What exactly is a type? Scripture gives us a hint. Look at that verse 14 in our text. Uh, that verse 14, again, we're in Romans chapter 5, verse 14. And that verse says, again, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of, uh, of Adam's transgression. And then look what it says, those last few words, who is the figure of him that was to come. So God says here, Adam was to be looked at as a figure of him that was to come. Now let me give you a little illustration of what uh, I feel like that means. In the big corporate world, Often a company prior to building, say, a big complex of, of buildings or, or a, a series of buildings will have a small-scale model um, displayed in anticipation of the actual building phase. And a lot of times what they can do is they can look at that small-scale model and they can even tweak how they would want to do things and it might even teach them some things about before they go into the final building phases that, oh, we better position this building a little bit different here because we won't have uh, room here and there. And of course, everything's on a scale, uh, and, and so it, it, it's demonstrating the exact position and the exact uh, uh, spacing and the footprint of the building and all that. And uh, so what it's doing is there's a purpose there, and that is to give them a, a, a kind of a foreview or a, a, a view prior to them uh, going into that big endeavor. Now the word type is, is derived, and I don't use this very often, and I don't even know if I should say it, but it's derived uh, from a Greek term, I won't even say what the term is. But it occurs 16 different times in different little bit of a usage in the New Testament. And we already saw the word figure there in our text. But there are several other variations of that same, uh, same word that they used in the Greek. It, it, it can mean print, or it can be used as print, uh, pattern, fashion, manner, form. Yet there's one general idea to what a type is. It's a likeness. So, so if we get the idea of what a type is, it is a likeness. Now, what is the purpose for a type? 
And uh, this is where I, I hope it will become a little bit more interesting. Because listen to what, what the purpose of a type is. Uh, types are pictures, object lessons, by which God taught his people concerning his grace and his saving power. Uh, the distinctive features of a type, uh, I have three listed here. Uh, the features of a type is it must be a true picture of the person or the thing it represents or prefigures. Uh, secondly, the type of, uh, must be of divine appointment. What do you mean by that? Meaning only God can make types. And their only purpose is to reveal the grand theme of God's grace. So when you look at our verse, so when I just said that, that, that only God can make types, and, and their only purpose is to reveal the grand theme of God's grace, look at our verse again. Because what this is talking about, if we think of it that way, when it's talking about that in the verse, it's the grand theme uh, of, uh, of God's grace. Uh, and it says again, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to, to come. And so thirdly, a type always pre, uh, prefigures something coming in the future. Now listen, in the Bible, a type, uh, there, there's, uh, a type can be a person, an event, or a thing. And so what we're going to look at tonight, with that in mind, uh, uh, um, we're going to look at just one thing, and that is a, a type as a person. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I want to show you uh, how a type kind of works. Uh, hopefully uh, through this little demonstration in Scripture. And uh, it'll kind of show us something and show us exactly how a type, um, a type functions and what's, what its purpose is. And so in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 45... I'm going to show you some of this. And it says, And so it is written, the first, and, uh, the first man, Adam, was a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So what you have there is you have uh, God making a comparison using types, using a type. So look at that verse. We're going to stay right here. Look at that verse. Again, it says, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now see how that went with our, our passage of scripture that we read in Romans chapter 5 verse 14. Don't turn back there. Let me read it again. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Now when it says Adam was the figure of him that was to come, you already probably guessed who the figure of him that was to come is. And, and if you hadn't figured it out yet, this surely helps us here, because then in, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, it says, And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Anybody know who the last Adam is? Yeah, Jesus Christ. So, so, uh, a, so when we look at that, now what I'd like you to do is do this. Um, underline, if, you do, if you're one that writes in your Bible, underline, made a living soul. Look at what it says there again in verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Now what I'm going to look at tonight is, is we're, we're going to use this as a type. And we're going to look at the difference between the two Adams. A difference between the two Adams. The first Adam, of course, we know as the Adam of Adam and Eve uh, at the beginning of Genesis. And then we've already mentioned that the last Adam is Jesus Christ. And so let's look at that first Adam, the Adam of Genesis uh, 126. Turn back there if you would. And, uh, but, uh, but, but keep this in your mind. I ask you to underline a... a a portion of scripture from our verse that we just looked at made a living soul. Remember that. Keep that in the back of your mind. Turn over to, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And I'm showing you kind of what the purpose of a type is. 
Um, I used to think, you know, it, like I said, I used to hear about types and people talk about types. And really it kind of bored me until I started to understand exactly what God was trying to accomplish when he was talking about uh, and, and when he was uh, using types in the Bible. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let, what we're going to do now is we're going to compare the types and see how important uh, a type is. 126, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, look what it says. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish, the sea, and over the fowl, the air, and over the cattle, and over all, uh, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, I want to ask you a question. Be careful how you answer this. How many here, when we think about uh, what, what, what that said about Adam in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, verse 45, when I told you to underline that, that made, he was, Adam was made a living soul. And in here it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our life, like this, uh, in, after our likeness and let them have dominion. Well, let's just stop right there. And God said, let, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so here's my question. Be careful how you answer this question. How many here were made with a living soul? You don't have to answer it. You can if you want. But think about it. How many here were made with a living soul? You ever thought about it? Anybody got guts enough to answer? How many here have a, have, were made with a living soul? And like I said, I said, be careful how you answer. And I, it, it, there is a wrong answer, but I'm going to say nobody's going to test it. You very wrong answer because I think most of you are probably not sure how to answer or you're answering wrong. How do you know that? Well, because, because Adam was a type. And I want to show you something. Uh, again, we ask ourselves, uh, we ask this question, how many of us were made with a living soul? And you know what I can say? Absolutely none of us. You sat there and you said, eh, I think I could have been, I think I was. Um, my answer would be, after I've studied this, of course, I probably would have said the same thing as you said if I hadn't looked at this a little bit more closely. But my, my answer to that question is absolutely none of us were made with a living soul. Adam was. Matter of fact, it says there again, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Uh, and so when you look at that, Adam was, but something happened to Adam that killed his soul. And, and all of a sudden, I think what you'll do is if we get through this, you'll go, oh yeah, that's right. So something happened to Adam that killed his soul from that moment on. And by nature, every man after Adam was born with a dead soul. Where do you see that at? Look at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. Look what it says. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden and dressed to dress it and to keep it, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, what did he tell him would happen? He said, For the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. You know what happened? He was born with a living soul. But when he... When, when what happened in Genesis chapter 3 happened, just like God promised, he died. Not physically. His soul died. And so just as I said, just as I said, it, it, be careful, you know, when I asked you, be careful how you answer this, because I don't blame you how you answered if you answered the opposite. When I, asked, when I asked how many here were made with a living soul, because when you really start to think that through, it's like, oh yeah. We weren't. We weren't made in the image uh, of Adam because Adam was made with a living soul according to what scripture says. But what happened is because he sinned, he, he died, his soul died. 
And then, of course, let me ask you now this question. Here's another question. Was you born with a dead soul? Yeah. Yeah, according to Scripture, if I was to look back at Romans chapter 5, very close to where Scripture was there in Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 5, uh, or be sorry, Romans chapter 5, verse 14, we're looking at, uh, let me read Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to you, and you've heard this many times. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So not only did the time clock start ticking, and one of the curses was that we would die because of our sin, but we also, because of Adam's sin, we were born with a dead soul. We didn't have a living soul, you see. And so let me ask you this. Let me flip-flop it to see if you get what I'm talking about. Was Cain and Abel born with a living soul? No. Because as soon as Adam sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, they died. Their soul died. And then according to the scripture, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So you see, what happened here is Cain and Abel was born with dead souls, just like us. And, and really there was only one man born with a living soul. That would have been Adam. One man. Now, I, I believe Eve was too, of course. He, she was taken out of the rib of Adam. But, he, but there's only one man that was born with a living soul, and that was Adam. Adam. And he was a failure at transferring a living soul to mankind. You see. He, in a sense, was the, listen to this, he was the antitype of Christ, in a sense. Now, what are you getting at here? Well, um, look back at our uh, scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, look at verse 45 again. 15 uh, verse 45, it says, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was, was made a quickening spirit. Now, now that, it's true that first Adam was a type. But he also was an anti-type because he does the opposite of what Christ would end up doing as the last Adam. Because it says there in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, the last Adam was the quickening spirit. Now, since the first Adam failed, mankind needed a second Adam. Is there anything where in the Bible it says second Adam? So I've heard that all my life, but when I... When I looked it up in Scripture, I couldn't find where it says second Adam. Huh? It's in a song. So it's, it's not even scriptural. It's, there's no such thing as a second Adam. There's a last Adam. And, and since the first Adam failed, mankind needed a second Adam. But Scripture presents this type as, as perfect and without failure. Matter of fact, that's exactly what that verse in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, is really a promise. Because it says, uh, the first man, Adam, was, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And so when it talks about that, it presents Christ as, as perfect and without failure. And what is this? What is this Adam's title, the last Adam? What does it say about this act? Well, he was made, it's talking about Christ, he was made a quickening spirit. Again, look what it says. Verse 45, uh, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now, here's a question here. I thought, here's what I would say. I would say, but preacher, I thought you said Christ was God. This said he was made. There's a lot of argument that goes on out there about, you know, you could go to a Jehovah's Witness and they'll say, see all these different scriptures where it says 
that Christ was made. You know, he was made a little lower than the angels. He was here. It says uh, he was. He was. Uh, it says he was made a quickening spirit. That proves to us. This is Job's witness talking. That proves to us that he is subservient to God. That he's not equal with God. And so it would be, it's reasonable for, uh, for someone to sit here and say, but preacher, I thought you said he was God, yet this verse says that he was made. Now, now what you also have to do is remember what scripture says about him. Remember in, uh, remember in John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word, what's it say? Was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, not God, but the word, Jesus Christ. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So if all things were made by him, then, then is it reasonable to say that Christ himself was made? No. So if all things were made by him, then it must be talking about this. Christ himself said this. John chapter 5, verse 21. For as the Father rise, uh, raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Now, who is the Son? The Word was with God and the Word was God. So when we read that, we realize that, wait a minute, when we're talking about here, this second Adam, that he was made, where it says there in verse, uh, verse 45 in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, this last Adam, he was the second Adam, he was the last Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Now what that means, that he was made, then really the, it's not talking about he, he was created or, or he was less than God. Matter of fact, there was one time when Christ himself, there's, there's one time that I found in Scripture when Christ himself had to be made. And here it was. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So in other words, the only, the, what Christ had to be made was he had to be made alive again. Now, you have to understand this. Christ, when he came down here on this earth and walked this earth, he was God, yet what's hard to grasp, what's hard to wrap your mind around, he was God, but yet he was self-limited and had to rely on God. He was God, but yet he had to rely on the Godhead to do what it, it, they needed to do to work the miracle that Christ was able to work. What do you mean? Well, listen to this. Let this mind be in you, which also in Christ, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. Are men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So you see what he was. He was a type of Adam, but he was the last Adam. Adam brought death into this world. But what Christ did as, as, the, as, as the type of Adam, the perfect type of Adam, the, uh, in, in Adam, the, the first Adam was the anti-type in some ways. But that last Adam, just like it says in our scripture, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, the first man Adam was uh, made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. That last Adam had to, had to redo what Adam couldn't do, the first Adam couldn't do. And, what the, and had to undo what the first Adam did, you see. Now listen to this. 
Finally, listen to this verse. For as in, Ad in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so, when we see what took place here, um, what we see here is just like what, and what that, what, what studying that little bit of type there did for me is it gives me a whole different look at Jesus Christ. And it brings it even closer together now that I understand the relationship that Christ has with God. And it doesn't puzzle me as much to say, how, how did Christ, how could Christ be fully God yet die? And how was he dependent on you know, God yet he was God? Well, what it shows us is, again, just like it, it, I mean, when I studied this little bit of type, it opened up Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 5 through 9 for me. In other words, let me read it again. Let this mind be in you, which, also, uh, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God because he was. He was God the Son. Yet, it says in verse, uh, uh, verse 7 of Philippians chapter 2, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, do you know, do you know how he was resurrected? Do you know what gave him the life, who, who gave him the life back? Wasn't it the Holy Spirit? Amen. And so, and so what happened, how he was subservient and what he ended up having to do. Where how what how he was and how we can say in this verse 45 that that it says he was made a quickening spirit. The only thing that he had to be dependent on God for. And rely on God for is that he would have he would have to rely on God to resurrect him. He had to be made alive again. Amen. Did he experience death to its fullness? He sure did. And it says here, uh, it says here, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. And so what he had to be made, what had to be made in him was he had to depend on God and the Holy Spirit to make him alive again. Hard to wrap our minds around it, but that's an amazing thing to think about. And then finally, listen to this verse, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 2 Corinthians 4.10 says, always bearing, uh, bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, Always bearing, I must have part of that missing. That don't sound right. Second Corinthians chapter four and verse ten. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse ten. Yeah, you know, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And so, what an amazing, what an amazing. Uh, um, Type when we think about the comparison of the first Adam and the last Adam. Amen. Hope that kind of opened it up about who Christ is and uh, how, how, yes, we can, if somebody was to argue with us about, see, we think that Christ was, was a lower form or was not equal to God because, look, it says he was made. The only thing that he had to be made was he had to be made live again. Amen. Father, we sure are grateful, Lord. I pray that you bless us. And we're thankful, Lord, to learn a little bit more about uh, the purpose of a type and uh, looking at this, uh, this person, person of Jesus Christ. And Lord, how there's a, there's a comparison, there's a type uh, of, of Adam, the two Adams, the first Adam and the last Adam. And Lord, I, I pray that that helped us to understand a little bit more, Lord, about Christ and what he has done for us. 
And Lord, we pray that you continue to bless us, help us, Lord, and open your scriptures up to us. And uh, Lord, we're thankful. Lord, uh, because I never did ask everybody tonight. I asked them, I asked them in a sense when, when I asked that question about whether we were living souls. Lord, I, I would also ask ourselves now, as each one of us sit here, can you answer this? Are you a living soul now? Because what Christ did when he came as the last Adam, and died on that cross when he was resurrected. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the one that gives us the opportunity to become a living soul. And so, and so as you sit here and contemplate that question, okay, Pastor, I understand that I was not born a living soul, that I was born with a dead soul. Well, what I would ask you now is we're uh, in, in this attitude of prayer, are you a living soul now? And if you're puzzled by that question, then what I would say is if you if you sit here tonight and you know that you've trusted in Christ, you call on Him, then what you did is you relied on the quickening spirit. If you put your faith and trust in Him and allowed Him to pay your sin wage, then what you have done is you have become a living, a living soul. Yes, you were born with a dead soul, but when you got saved, you got born again and became a living soul. So Lord, we sure are thankful, Lord, for that. And Lord, we're thankful to learn a little bit more about the, the comparison of the two atoms. And Lord, if there's someone here tonight that's struggling on whether they're a living soul tonight, I pray that they would come to the altar and take care of that. They might say, well, what do I got to do? Well, what you have to do is, is allow Christ to, to bring to life your soul. Is that hard to do? No, not at all. What you do is you realize you're a sinner, realize that Christ paid that sin wage for you. And as soon as you accept him as your savior, realize you can't save yourself. Then what he does is he comes and lives in you and brings life into your soul. Brings eternity. And so what a blessing. And so I, Lord, pray that you help us. If there's someone here tonight, Lord, that is not saved, pray that they would come to the altar. And again, Lord, we're thankful for the type, for the picture that you have given us. That I would hope clarifies and clears things for us about what the purpose of salvation is and how we were born with a dead soul. But because we placed our faith and trust in you, Lord, we have become a living soul. God, the world by wisdom knew not God. 
It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Let's pray. Lord, thank you this day for your blessed service tonight. And we'll ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, what we're focusing on there is verse 23. It says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. The Apostle Paul at this time, he had been dealing with, he dealt with the Jews and he dealt with Gentiles. And what he's saying there is, he, with these Jews, these Jews grew up, where does it say, he said that the oracles of God were given to the Jews. And what happened was, these Jews for thousands of years, God was dealing with them, they were God's chosen people. And then when Jesus Christ came along, they balked at it. And wouldn't accept the him as their Messiah. It was a stumbling block to them. They couldn't get over it. And then he says in Romans 10 that they go about now to establish their own righteousness. Because they don't submit themselves to the righteousness of God. Which is Jesus Christ. And he also says here, he had been dealing with the Greeks. You go to the Greeks. He said you go to the Gentiles, the Greeks. And you preach Christ crucified. And it's foolishness unto them. And just like he says in verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is them that perish foolishness. But on us which are saved is the power of God. Now keep that in mind and we'll turn to Acts. Acts chapter 17. And we'll look at a little story that maybe, I don't know, the, 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 the makeup of the time of when 1 Corinthians was written in comparison to what the, the uh, things that happened in Acts to Paul. But maybe this was one of those things that maybe was in his mind when he wrote 1 Corinthians. And maybe I'm way off. Maybe this happened after he wrote 1 Corinthians. I don't know. But uh, we'll go to uh, uh, chapter 17 of Acts. We'll start at 16, uh, verse 16 of chapter 17 of Acts. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Others, some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus in the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine, whereof thou speakest, is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would not, we would now therefore what these things mean. Verse 21 For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent uh, their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the, this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that this is he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, Neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one nation, uh, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain of also your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Verse 32, and when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. So as it says in 1 Corinthians, where Paul says to the Greeks, We, we preach Christ crucified, and the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness, we'll see here in chapter 17 that he was right on. And also we'll see here in verse 17, or in, in chapter 17, we'll see the old adage that the more things change, the more things stay the same. 
Because what we have here in chapter 17 is Paul comes to Athens. That's a, a city in Greece. It's still there. Uh, you can visit it today, Athens. It says right here that he, he disputed with the Jews in the synagogues. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans, this is verse 18, and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seems to be a set of forth of strange gods. So what happens is, is these, these Stoics, these philosophers, they, they, they find out Paul who's preaching Christ crucified. He's, he's debating, he's, he's disputing with the Jews in the synagogues. And they said, hey, you know, we need, let's go see what this guy's got to say. He seemed to be, he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods. And hey, gods are our thing, man. We've got, we've got all these, these altars to all these gods. We've even got, just in case we miss one, we've got an altar to the unknown god, just in case. And so they bring him to a place, and in verse 19 it says, they brought him unto Aeropagus. Now when I first read this, what you had to do, I had to look this up, I had to do a little study in this. When I seen this Aeropagus, I thought, well, what is this Aeropagus? Is this a, is this a person? Is this a place? Because it says right there, they brought an Aeropagus, and in verse 22 it says, and Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. So I thought, what is this Aeropagus? Is this this like uh, Confucius kind of guy that sits around on Mars Hill and people come to listen to him talk? So they brought Paul unto him to, 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 for Paul to talk to this guy? Well, no, what it is is Aeropagus, is a rock outcropping outside of Athens. And there's, you can look at it, there's pictures of it. There's actually, there's actually there today, there's a, there's a stone with a big plaque on it that has verses uh, 22 through, 20, or through uh, 31 printed on it. Paul's little sermon that he preached there, there's a plaque there. It's almost, it's a rock outcropping that's almost like an amphitheater. And, and you say, well, what did they do there? Well, it says in verse 21 what they did. They all gathered together. It says right there, for all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time and nothing else but to either to tell or to hear some new thing. And I talked about this in, the, in, in children's church a couple weeks ago with the kids. I asked them if anybody had heard about a TED Talk. And what a TED Talk is, is I looked that up today. I know what they were, but I just wanted to get a, 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 a like Wikipedia feel of what it is. And TED Talks are these things where they have these people that are like experts in their field, and they come up on the stage and they do the they do the uh, the old oh what was his name? What was the Apple guy's name? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. So they, they put the little boom mic on and they'll walk around with their hands like this, and they'll, and they'll tell what all what they know about how what they do for a living. You know, they'll they'll have so and so come up and talk about his his expertise, and they've got a big black, it'll be big dark, and you know, it almost looked like a, almost looked like a liberal church, you know, like a, like a, uh, a contemporary church or something, and this guy will be up there with a little boom mic, and he'll be walking around and, and pontificating on what he knows about, and that's exactly what these people did back in Athens 2,000 years ago, and like I said, what you'll find out is what this Bible says 2,000 years ago, nothing's changed, they're still doing the same thing. They sat around back then to hear, or to, to, and spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And everybody today does the same exact thing. 24-hour news, CNN, Fox News, uh, you know, your phone, you've got to have the updates of what, what, the, what the latest and greatest thing is. Everybody, everybody wants to know something you don't know. Everybody wants to be the first to know. And that's what these Athenians did. They sat around and spent their time in nothing else but to hear, either to tell or to hear some new thing. They sat around and they get up and, well, this guy knows something about this, so he put the little boom mic on at, at Aeropagus and he walked around and, and, and tell exactly, you know, all this garbage about what he knew about a subject. And what the thing is, is in verse 22, it's called Mars Hill. What it is, is this was, this was during a time of the Roman domination of the world. Aeropagus was the Greek name for this area, but the Romans, you'll find out the Romans called it Mars Hill. So it's the same place, two different names, it was two different kinds of people. The Romans called it Mars Hill, but the Greeks called it Aeropagus. And so what Paul says, as Paul says in, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, that he preached Christ crucified to the, to the Greeks' foolishness, just like it says here, so when he shows up to Aeropagus, Mars Hill, 
and preaches Christ crucified, look what happens. Verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So here are these people. They were, All they wanted to know was something new. They wanted to hear, they wanted to hear, all they did was sit around wanting to hear something new. So Paul gave them something new. That's why they brought him there. That's why these Stoics, these philosophers said, hey, we've never heard this before. We better go, we better bring him over and set him up there. So they gave Paul, they gave Paul the boom mic. So Paul gets all ready. Because he knows he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna pin him to the wall. And just like as Paul always does, he's got a little sarcasm. So Paul puts the boom mic on, puts his hands like this, and it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. He says, For as I pass by and be out of devotions, he says, I'm walking in, I see your altars here. You've got, a, you've got an altar for everything. You've got, you know, you've got an altar for a God, you've got a God for everything. And in the elder of oceans, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. He says, you've got all these altars. You guys sit around here and, and want to know something new. You want to cover all your bases. You've got all these altars for all these different gods. You want to cover all your bases. That even in, in, case you, in, in case you forgot a certain God, you made an altar to the unknown God. He goes, so I don't care about any of these other ones. But there's a God that you don't know. And he says, Where the, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. He goes, I'm going to tell you about that one that you don't know. You ignorantly worship him, but I'm going to tell you who he is. And you might have made an altar to the unknown God. I'm going to tell you about an unknown God. It's the one you should have known from the beginning. And in verse 24, he goes on and tells them. He tells them how uh, God, in the beginning, created Created man, he didn't need, he doesn't need you building building altars for him. See, he created you. He says he doesn't need you to build altars for him. He created man. Why would he need anything? See, it says, he says, see, he give it to all life and breath and all things. He don't need nothing from you. And he says, not only that, he's going to judge you because he's appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men. And that he has raised him from the dead. Just like we've seen before. And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. Now the biggest thing I took from these two things, that what Paul knew about these, these Greeks, they think that the preaching of the cross is foolishness. The biggest thing I took from this, and like I told the kids in the back, and this is going to be a short, this is going to be a, this is going to be short tonight. But this is this is the big because this is the main thought right here. You go out in this world and you tell people you're a Christian and you know they laugh, they scoff, you know they they don't believe it, they don't believe, you know just, they think it's foolishness, just like the apostle Paul says they would. We got people out there and it says right there they spend their time in nothing else but to hear either to tell or to hear some new thing. We've got 24-hour news. Everybody's got to know what's going on. They want to hear something new. But they don't want something new. They, they say they want something new, but when you try and give it to them, they don't want it. They don't want, they want something new, but they don't want a new birth. They want something new, but they don't want a new life in Christ. They want something new, but they don't want a new testament. They want something new, but they don't want, you know, as, as the Bible says, behold, all things are become new when you get saved. They say they want something new, but when you hold them to it, they just want the same old thing. Two thousand years of church, two thousand years of history between between you know you know two thousand years, give or take a few between the, what this happened in Acts and now, between what happened in Acts seventeen and now. Like I said, it's the same exact thing. They said they wanted something new then. They didn't really want it when Paul wanted to give it to them. They say they want something new now. They really don't want it when you want to give it to them. Just like I said, they don't want they don't want to change. They don't really want to change. So the, the the gist of it tonight is you might get scoffed at. You might get scoffed at by people who you try to witness to and they don't want to get saved. But take it as, don't take it as, well, you know, I guess you know, is this I don't know what, you know, all these people are making fun of me for being a Christian. 
All they're doing is proving the Bible to you. They didn't want it then. Why do you think they'd want it now? They don't want something new. They want the same old thing they've had the whole time. They just say they want something new. So back in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and things which are despised, that God chose, and yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh shall glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according to as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So if you're in here tonight and you're saved, and you think, well, I'm, I'm pretty smart, I did pretty well in school. Well, you're not saved because you're smart. Because it says right there, uh, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. And what he's saying is you won't see, you don't see uh, world leaders and these, these people that everybody, if you find a person, if you find a person that everybody in the world thinks, man, they're just, they're just smart, they're just awesome, they're probably not talking about someone who's a Christian. If you can get everybody a, a consensus of people in this world to agree on that one person, man, that guy, he's he's so bright. He's you know he's one of those you know he's gonna be a he's gonna be a a, a, a great you know a great mind a great thinker you know you know he's probably gonna write some books. He's probably not a Christian because right there it says, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Why? Because God has chosen, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and that which are despised, have God chosen, and yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So when you're out there in the world and you're trying to witness to people and they think it's stupid, they think it's foolishness. You know, even even with this this Christ, the, you know the and I'm not big on I'm not big on you know the Christmas thing about you know I don't the Bible never says to to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ and I think I think if you go back uh, I think you'll find out that probably Jesus wasn't even born in December but what you'll find is just like just like the Apostle Paul says I just read it too where he says if you know, whether in whether in pretense or in truth that Christ is Christ is preached, I glory. If someone if someone if you're gonna get the world to think about Jesus Christ, if they, if they're gonna think about Jesus Christ during Christmas time, then then use it as a use it as a chance to witness. Don't you know, don't blow everybody out of the water. If if an unsaved person comes to you and brings up Jesus Christ being born at Christmas time, don't say no, he wasn't. He wasn't born at Christmas. And then in the conversation, no, use it as a use it as an opportunity to witness. But even 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 like the even I just seen a sign on a church the other day that says, "Hope for all mankind was born in the manger." And just like the Apostle Paul says there in First Corinthians one, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Who would have believed? Who would have believed that eternal salvation would have started? With a baby being born in a barn, that doesn't sound very wise to a to a human being, and that just proves the point that God uses the foolish things of this world. He uses the foolishness of God is wiser than the, the wisdom of man. He uses the foolish things to confound the wise. So the point is tonight: don't be discouraged if you if if in this world these people you know they put you down for they, you know for being a Christian oh you believe that because they've been doing it for the last 2,000 years there's nothing new under the sun they were doing this they, everybody was looking for a new thing then they didn't want it 
everybody's looking for a new thing now when you try and give it to them and they don't want it. And just like Paul says, we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness. But the Apostle Paul, it didn't change what the Apostle Paul did. He still preached Christ crucified. He said, I don't care if it's a stumbling block to the Jews. I don't care if the, the Greeks think it's foolishness. I'm just going to preach Christ crucified. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Pray you be with us tonight. Help us to realize that no matter what, no matter what people think, whether it's a stumbling block to them or if it's foolishness to them, 